May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do please be seated. When I was about the age of the youngest chorister here, which was about the same time I first visited your beautiful cathedral, I hated to be in the wrong. And I strongly suspect if you were to be so impertinent as to ask my family, who happened to be here in three generations, they would tell you that actually I haven't changed all that much. I would be, choir, someone who would have found it very hard when the eagle ears of Sarah MacDonald found me out in a wrong note. And actually, you can ask her whether that's still true, because, as you've just heard, she's my director of music, too, in my chapel at Selwyn. And as I got older, things didn't get much better. And actually, now there was a new development. Now I never wanted to be put in the wrong in any debate, and I'd wriggle out of arguments like an intellectual Houdini in order not to be. And the kings and queens scholars may like to hear and learn the lesson that I also hated to ever expose my written work to someone else's eye or editing. And now there was a new family maxim, tongue in cheek in the extreme, Bella's always right, they would say. I had to have the last word, it meant really. I had to be always already perfect. Now, of course, the truth was, I wasn't always right, or always good, or always anything so perfect and ideal as that. And sometimes it was, and still is, extremely painful and unhappy trying to be. In the church, we discover together how important the quest for truth, for truth of belief and truth of life is. But we also come to understand in our life as members of Christ's body that being right isn't the same as being righteous and that neither truth of belief nor truth of life are things we can get to immediately or on our own. Now, I wonder if you, like me initially, in some ways, found today's gospel reading a bit uncomfortable. Jesus' words very clearly recommend that we point out the faults of others, and not just once or discreetly, although that's where things begin, but going on at it more and more publicly until all the options are exhausted. Fault finding. We might think, surely, the Christianity I profess has a morality of love, non-judgment, and peace. And we might also recall some other passages we know from the scriptures, from the same gospel, in fact, which seem to contradict this one. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? And behind judging others too intemperately can actually be a huge fear of being judged ourselves. One of the things the Lord's Prayer is really important in doing is pointing out to us every time we say it that we are all both sinned against and singing, sinning. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's no such thing as being always right. 
There's no such thing as being always wrong. It's one of the troubling features of our contemporary culture that it can sometimes feel, especially in politics and in the media and social media, that we've forgotten that so human fact. So much of public opinion now seems to be about working out who is in the right and who is in the wrong in a very black and white way. But we're also at a cultural moment where truth has confusingly, paradoxically, also become rather unfashionable when compared to opinion and personal feeling. My truth, you might have heard, which can nonetheless, my truth, be heavily weaponized against others. That is to say, given the kind of weight and heft we'd usually give to more absolute, deeper, shared truth. And this reading of ours today does show us in its insistence that we work together to discern and receive and articulate the truth, that truth matters. A faith that never took personal responsibility to call out the wrong, the wicked, and the destructive would be a faith which had not and could not produce the martyrs, the heroines, the heroes of Christian conviction. Edith Stein is a pretty good patron saint for scholars of a sacred foundation. She was a brilliant philosopher who went on to become a Carmelite nun. She was also, as she wrote in her great letter denouncing Nazism to the Pope in 1933, a child of the Jewish people. And she went willingly to what she knew would be almost certain death amongst them in Auschwitz in 1942. Just as we hear in our reading from Ezekiel, if we can have the bravery to call out the wrong we see, to warn the wicked, it's something which saves the lives of all, accuser and accused. The wrongs humans do to one another, as that reading also makes so clear, are actually deeply painful burdens on those who go wrong, as well as those wronged against. Our transgressions weigh on us, it says. But it's also so important that we have our reading today from Romans as well, with that golden commandment of love from Jesus' mouth, love your neighbor as yourself. For Christians finding fault and exercising judgment to free one another, yes, from our burdens, must be done in love. And Christian judgment, Christian discernment of good and evil, never exempts the one judging. It must be as much towards ourselves as others. It must be in the context of mutual discernment, admission of fault, receiving of forgiveness. That's what we practice in this Eucharist and in everything we do in church. And if we read the gospel passage again with this love in mind, the love Jesus' life and death joins us to forever we actually see how close the connection is between the fault finders and those found at fault. They are family. The word our translation gives as member of the church is in the Greek language in which it was first written down, adelphos, the word for brother, or in the plural, for brother or sister. This is a family, accuser and accused, the deepest kind of family, trying 
to find unity together. And neither does our gospel reading leave us in the bleakness of mutual accusation and correction. Because as well as saying that, yes, fault will be found, repairs must be made, hard conversations had, when things are amiss, and when the burdens of going wrong weigh very heavy. Our gospel says that when we come together in truth, when we can agree, or actually when we can even just get together in one place and face in one direction, as we do now towards the altar, extraordinary things will happen. It will be done for you. For when two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. So in our life in God, it's not just all right to be in the wrong. Being wrong is the gate to life. We are utterly unfinished beings who are moving together and in love towards the most extraordinary completeness. Being unfinished is what makes life so life-giving and so exciting. And in this, we hear today, God doesn't leave each of us on our own, but entrusts us to one another as those who always care more than to leave someone else struggling in the dark. So let us all pray today in our singing and our saying and our hearts that we may be ever more drawn together in the unity of the spirit and in the bond of peace to sing a closer and a closer harmony, rejoicing to be wrong, that we may be made ever more right with Lord, our Lord all the way from eight to a hundred and eight. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.